Today, we want to continue looking at the fundamental theorem of calculus. Yesterday, we had the example where we looked at the graph of f prime on the interval from 0 to 12. We are adding to stuff that we learned before. We used to say that the, when the derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. What we're adding is that we now know by how much the function is increase, uh, decreasing. And that would be the area bounded by the graph of the derivative and the x-axis. So on the interval from 0 to 3, we see that the derivative, f prime, is below the x-axis. So that means that the function is decreasing. The area bounded by the graph of f prime and the x-axis on the interval from 0 to 3 is 3. So we'll say that f decreases by 3. Then we can make the same arguments in the other direction. When f prime is positive, then f is increasing. The area tells you by how much. So if we break this interval from 0 to 12 into three unit subintervals, we can see that from 0 to 3, capital F will decrease by 3. And then from 3 to 6, we'll see an increase of 3. And then from 6 to 9, we'll see an increase of 6. And then from 9 to 12, we'll see an increase of 3 based on the area and whether the area is above the x-axis or below the x-axis. What the definite integral is telling us is how much the function is changing, but it's not telling us about values of the function. We're getting how much the function is changing, the changes in the function, but not where to start. For example, if I told you that I drove 30 miles yesterday, you have no idea, or even if I say I drove 30 miles north yesterday, you have no idea where I ended up. You just know how far I drove. Or if you go up to your professor's door back when we used to go up to offices and there's a little sticky note on the door that says back in 10 minutes, you know what the change in time is going to be, but you don't know when the professor is going to be back. You're just given the change. I'll be back in 10 minutes, but you don't know when that note was posted. So you don't know when the professor will be back. Just like I said, when I'll drive 30 miles to the north, you know what direction I went and how far I went, but you don't know where I ended up because you don't know where I started. You don't know where I ended up. So we need an additional piece of information about the function. So if we were given, let's suppose, that capital F evaluated at zero is equal to 10. Now that we have an additional piece of information about the function, we can complete the table of values. Now that we know at least one value of the function, Now that we have at least one value for the function, we can complete the table of values. But we have to be given that piece of information. So now that we have this f of 0 is 10, I could put 10 in when f is equal to when x is equal to 0, and then I can complete the table of values. So if f of 0 is equal to 10, then f of 3 is equal to 7. f of 6, we're back up to 10. f of 9 will be at 16. f of 12 will be at uh, 19. So we can also 
use uh, the definite, uh, the fundamental theorem. So we know that the integral from zero to three of f prime at x dx is equal to negative three. The function decreases by three on the interval from zero to three. This will be equal to capital F at three minus capital F at zero. If we're now given that capital F at zero is equal to 10, Now that we have this value for the function, we can calculate f of three. We'll add 10 to both sides. And this tells us that capital F of three is equal to seven. So we couldn't complete this table until we had at least one value for capital F. Let's suppose that there was some other function f in a new example. Let's suppose that capital F at six was equal to two. And we wanted to complete the table of values now. So let's see, you have x and capital F of x. Um, got zero, x three, six nine and 12. And I'm gonna use the same F prime. So we have the same changes from zero to three, we decrease by three. From three to six, we'll increase by three. From six to nine, we'll increase by six. And from nine to 12, we increase by three. Here, our given information is that f of six is equal to two. So my given information goes in this spot. f of six is equal to two. But we can still use this to figure out the rest of the table. So if f of six is equal to two, f of nine is equal to two plus six or eight. And f of 12 is eight plus three, 11. If we're going back the other way, we got to think what plus three is two. So we must have started off at negative one. Negative one plus three is two. And we got to figure out what we started off at zero. Something minus three is negative one. So we must have started off at zero at two. Two minus three is negative one. Negative one plus three is two. Two plus six is eight. Eight plus three is 11. So if we have one piece of information, If we have one piece of information, we can find a specific antiderivative. We can complete the table of values. Here's how we want to think about it. The antiderivative will tell us about the shape of the function, but not the vertical location of the function. So the derivative. The derivative is telling us the shape of the function, but not the vertical location of the function. So the derivative is giving us the shape of the function. It's telling us how one value changes to another but it doesn't tell you tell us where to start.
let's take a look at why that is if we start getting into mechanical bits. So recall that when in the fundamental theorem of calculus, we'll say the integral from a to b of little f of x dx is capital F at b minus capital F at a, where capital F is an antiderivative of the function little f. This is because antiderivatives determine the shape of a function, but not a vertical location of the function. Also recall, that if the derivative um, with respect to x of x to the n is nx to the n minus 1, then if we turn this around into an integral, instead of multiplying by the exponent and then subtracting 1 from the exponent, we do the inverse operations in reverse order. We add 1 to the exponent and then divide by the exponent. So if we have the integral or the antiderivative of x to the third dx, we should get one fourth x to the four. But one fourth x to the fourth is not the only function whose derivative is x to the third. One fourth x to the fourth is not the only function whose derivative is x to the third. It's an antiderivative of x to the third, but it's not the antiderivative of x to the third. The derivative of one fourth x to the fourth is certainly x to the third, but also the derivative of one fourth x to the fourth, let's say, plus five. Because derivative is a linear operator, the, uh, we can just take the derivative a term at a time. The derivative of one fourth x to the fourth is x to the third. And the derivative of five is zero. Here's another one. If we take the derivative of one fourth x to the fourth minus seven, we also get x to the third, but the derivative of seven is equal to zero. we're gonna have many different antiderivatives of x to the third. They're all gonna have the same shape and they'll all be vertical shifts of each other. The only difference will be in the constant. So the antiderivatives of x to the third will all have the form one fourth x to the fourth plus some constant.
This plus C we'll call the constant of integration. And we can't know what it is unless we have an additional piece of information about the function. So this C is called the constant of integration. We need an additional piece of information about the function to figure out what the constant of integration is. So we would need an additional piece of information. We can't just say that the derivative is x to the third. That'll get us to the form of our antiderivative, but it won't tell us what specific um, function we were, we were looking for. We'll refer to this x, one fourth x to the fourth plus c as the general antiderivative. We'll refer to this one fourth x, x to the fourth plus c with the constant of integration as the general antiderivative. We might also refer to this as the indefinite integral. So if we have an additional piece of information, for example, if we have a function, something that looks like this. So if let's say capital F prime of X is equal to sine X, and F of zero is equal to four, then find capital F of X. So here we have two pieces of information about the function capital F. We have the derivative and one value for the function. The derivative is gonna give us the general antiderivative, the form that our function will take. F of zero is equal to four will help us figure out the constant of integration. So sine of X, this, this is where we'll get the general antiderivative. And f of zero equals four is how we're gonna, we're gonna use to find the, in, the constant integration. So we're looking for a function whose derivative is sine x. We know that the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So the derivative of negative cosine is sine. The general antiderivative is gonna be f of x is negative cosine of x plus some constant of integration. So the derivative of negative cosine x plus some constant will be uh, sine x plus zero because the derivative of a constant is zero. There's our general antiderivative. Now we use the fact that f of zero is equal to four to find the constant of integration. So f of zero equals four tells us that minus cosine of x plus some constant, oops not of x, minus cosine of zero.
plus some constant of integration is equal to four. Cosine of zero is equal to one. So negative one plus C is equal to four. So C is equal to five. So the function that fits this description where the derivative is sine X and F of zero is equal to four is the function negative cosine X plus five. That fits the description that the derivative is sine X and F of zero is equal to four. Derivative of negative cosine X plus five is sine X plus zero and negative cosine times zero plus five is negative one plus five, which is four. So that fits both parts. Any questions? Yes, Professor Leach. Um, on the very last sentence, so every time Okay, for well, the very last one, we have f of x equal negative cosine x plus five. Mm -hmm. So if we plug the zero, then we can find out a constant. Is that what it means? Any formula? Um, no, that's just, we just plugged in zero because that's the information that we have. Oh, where does zero come in? Oh, oh, I see it. You get four, okay f of zero is equal to four. That was a given piece of information. Okay, so anything with that, we plug it in, then we get the constant, am I right? Yeah, you take the okay. given information, plug it into your general antiderivative, and that will tell you the constant of integration. Um, one more thing, Professor Lich, can you scroll up a little bit? Um, yes, a uh, little bit more. Yes, so very top on the right, we have d, dx, one over four x to the four power equal x to the third. That is uh -huh. the derivative. And then on the bottom, on the you put on the square, we have antiderivative of x cubed. We have one over four x to the four power plus c. Mm -hmm. And then to the note on the bottom, is we have like need to know a uh, value of big F to find c. Where this big F belong to? Is it belong to derivative or antiderivative? That's the antiderivative. We need to know something about where the, we do the integration because we're given the derivative. Mm. So F prime, that tells us the general antiderivative. And then we need a piece of information about the function to find the constant of integration. Uh, one more thing for Fresnelich. On the top we have D, D, X, is that the big F? Am I right? Yes. The yeah. On the one fourth x to the fourth would be like one fourth x to the fourth would be what I called f, a capital F. With the prime. And x to the third is f prime. Okay. Thanks, Professor Lich. Thank you. Any other questions? So the thing that we want to notice is that the antiderivatives all have the same shape, but there's this constant of integration and changing a constant of integration just moves a function up and down. Uh, one more question, please, Professor Lich. On the very bottom, on the left, we have f of x minus negative cosine x plus c. Do we need anything like big F prime? Do we need anything of that now? What, what do you mean? Um, oh, you know what, never mind. It's the example on the top. I will yeah. do that, thanks. All right. So here's our business with the fundamental theorem of calculus. We wanna think of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, we want to think about area, and we want to think about um, the definite integral of a rate of change will tell us how much the function is changing. We want to get used to this new process of finding antiderivatives and knowing that we have a general antiderivative with a constant of integration, and that we need an additional piece of information 
to figure out which of the vertically shifted shapes we have. The shape will always be the same, but we need an additional piece of information to figure out what the constant is. We need something other, something else about, about we need just one value of the function. Any questions, comments, or deep thoughts? All right, this only seems like a lot to remember because it's a lot to remember. You have to remember all of it all the time in perfect detail. But that's going to do it for today. I'll see you all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day, and thanks for playing.